Thank you for joining me. Um, last session of the day, then we get drinks. Yay. Uh, <laughs> drinking is not secret to high performing teams. <laughs> so, my, my talk's actually about this t shirt. Um, it says Team Awesome Special Projects. It's about a series of projects we did in Oman. I uh, worked for a company called ChiliSoft, and we had the opportunity to engage with a client there for a year long project. Well, projects. Uh, it's actually three projects in one. There were two software projects and one training project. So it wasn't any good to go over and just build software for the client. Um, you know, they wanted their guys to be able to look after it, maintain it, and keep it at the level at which we'd, we'd made it. Uh, ChiliSoft's quite big on craftsmanship and quality. Uh, we'd done other work with them before. Uh, we'd done some other projects. We'd done some training. And so they, they, they knew these were things that they wanted to, to bring into their organizational culture. So it was quite an interesting project in the fact that we not only were we crossing cultures at the, the human level, we were crossing cultures at the organizational level. They're a very waterfall, you know, top-down type of organization. Um, Agile was a very new concept to them. So we had ChiliSoft on the, I would call the more extreme end of Agile, Lean, whatever you want to term it, to typical waterfall, very top-down type management uh, environment. I think there were, if I remember correctly, there were nine members on the team, uh, six developers, two project managers, and myself. I fit somewhere in the technical spectrum. Uh, I was very happy to have project managers. It meant I could actually focus on the team and the technical things I enjoy. Um, and the project was still you know, moving forward, and all the administration and the day-to-day -day stuff got taken care of in that space. Um, it was a unique project in the fact that it was fixed scope, fixed budget, fixed time, you know, fighting the iron triangle, something that doesn't really work out very often in software projects. Um, but, you know, we managed, we managed to do that. I'm here giving a talk about uh, how we, we managed to pull it all together and deliver. Uh, as far as, you know, agile methods, I can't say we took and used any one methodology. Um, you know, ChiliSoft's a very kind of organic company in that sense. Um, we do some Kanban, we might do some scrummy type things. Um, you know, we had to inject a bit of waterfall just because of the, the constraints of the client. You know, they're used to working that way. In order to, you know, scope a fixed budget, fixed time project, we've got to go get the requirements. We've got to figure out what they actually want us to build. We can't do things just in time. Um, so, it was an interesting project. Um, you know, we we were crossing cultures. There were some unique environmental constraints. Um, you know, the first one being we, we thought our site office would be ready when we got there. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, we spent, I think, three or four months waiting um, for our actual office to come online. Uh, which, you know, probably wouldn't have been such a big deal if we had more than one internet PC. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing, um, you know, how often you, you Google and you take things and you paste it and you, you, know, you, you rely on the internet to actually do research and find code. So the environment had some unique constraints. It was a, it was a high security environment. So the, the work network was separate from the internet. There was an air gap. So when I say one internet PC, there really was a queue of guys waiting to actually Google things and figure out how to do stuff. Uh, this was complicated by the fact that, you know, only part of the team knew the technology we were, technologies we were working with. We were using Angular and JavaScript, um, so the Omanis weren't incredibly comfortable with that. Some of the guys we brought over, you know, newish. They may know JavaScript, but they didn't necessarily know Angular. And even if you did know Angular, it was a bit difficult to remember every little detail. So fortunately, Richard, being the awesome project manager he was, managed to sort that out, got us some more internet PCs, and we overcame a hurdle. Some of the project highlights, uh, well, you know, this was the first time that the client had had a contractor actually deliver a project on time and on budget. They weren't, they weren't prepared for this scenario. Uh, you know, we planned things out, kind of taking that waterfall approach, at least to give a, a big enough picture of what's happening. And when the time came to tell them about the architecture and the infrastructure requirements, you know, we need 26 servers with the specs, they're like, that's, that's cool, you know, we'll get on ordering that. 
Found out later that they never did order them because they didn't actually think we were going to finish. They never had anyone finish on time and on budget. And so, you know, the fact that we were able to do that was, it was a really nice experience. It showed them that Agile can work. You know, you don't always have to be a waterfall-type organization. For more of the, the chili soft side, we were able to find ways of packaging some of this learning that we had uh, uncovered and refined. So some things were new. Some things were just kind of a distillation of some of uh, the core practices within ChiliSoft already. And we were able to package these up and offer them to, to other clients. So there's a, we're kind of taking some of the components of our secret sauce, if you want to call it that. There are no silver bullets. Um, and in you know, getting other teams to engage with these concepts. You know, one such idea is the idea of doing mob TDD, mob cartas. Uh, so not necessarily mob programming in production, but taking a carta like you would practice TDD with and doing it in a mob setting. Another idea that uh, we kind of distilled out of this space was the idea of software conversations, meaning setting aside time every week to just talk about concepts, don't, not touching the code. And this, is, this has come out in the form of uh, core coding principles, uh, which I've just finished delivering. Uh, and you know, it's been fantastic. Um, so it's nice to be able to, to take these practices and play them forward. Well, since we're talking about high-performing teams, what actually is a high-performing team? Well, it's more than the best people working on a problem. It's really down to actually having a shared set of values um, in the technical space. I can't say necessarily at the personal space because we're all unique individuals. Um, you know, I would say for a long time I really thought, you know, I'll make any team great. Just give me the best guys possible. Well. Really, this was a, an opportunity for me to learn and grow that that's not the, the correct way to approach this. It's about building consensus around technical practices, about making sure we're all marching in the same direction. We all agree that things like TDD are important. We all agree that we shouldn't leave if there's a broken build. You know, the fundamental issues. It's also about creating an environment where each team member trusts other team members. You know, they're free to express their feelings and ideas. Everyone's working towards the same goal. Not necessarily that you know, I'm doing my task and they're doing their task and together they'll come, they'll merge in together and we'll deliver a feature, but you know, we're focusing at a feature level. We're not focusing at an individual level. It's clear how the team works together to accomplish their tasks and disagreements viewed as a good thing, conflicts are managed. I tend to be the type of individual that thrives on a bit of friction. Um, my my right-hand man in the technical space also so needless to say, there was a fair bit of friction happening during the course of the project. This was a new experience for the Imani guys. They're a very friendly, calm type of culture. Um, so they, they were a little confused at first how we could argue and then go have lunch together. Uh, and we explained that it was about evolving the system, finding a different way to you know, add value or you know, improve the design. It made a bit more sense to them. Still not quite. 100% uh, bought into being the best way of doing things, but it worked for us. So with, with you know, out ChiliSoft being an amazing value-driven organization, I don't think I would have had the foundation to, to play in and actually create this team culture of, of high performance. Uh, you know, value-driven culture supports the human behaviors that bring about enthusiasm, passion, and commitment. Uh, you know, these are things that are critical for success. So some of the, some of the values that uh, are part of ChiliSoft that I think really showed up in this project were creating long-lasting and creative partnerships. So we'd already done work with the Omanis. You know, we're doing more projects. There's an opportunity there. We're carrying that forward. Focused on adding measurable value. We're really value-driven. You know, we want to make sure that we're adding things to the system that people are going to find value. We're making their life easier. Uh, creating delightful customer and user engagement. So, you know, I think the fact that, you know, we delivered the project on time and on budget was fantastic. The customer was, was clearly excited about that. Uh, even down to the user experience, you know, actually working through wireframes and discussing how the, the interaction with the system would work. There was, there was a lot of data. It was easy to get overloaded. I think we found some unique ways of, of solving those types of challenges. And, you know, one of the more important ones, I believe, is this idea of becoming experts in a domain. So while we were doing mob cartas during our deliberate practice time, we're really focusing on servicing this value, this, this idea of becoming experts, becoming masters. So 
So, you know, we've got some values, we've got some ideas of high performing teams. You know, how are we going to get the Imani guys up to speed in such a way that they're going to be able to contribute meaningfully? You know, we're actually going to be able to integrate these two, these two sets of teams uh, into one coherent high performing team. Well, we did a boot camp. We did a two week boot camp. Uh, we went around. Um, so we paired a South African guy with an Omani guy so that we could get to know each other on a personal level. Uh, and we could start to instill core technical practices. So as much as I may stand up here and talk about some of the fluffy management -y stuff, I don't think it had, would have the impact if we didn't have a core technical foundation on which to build. So core practices for us at ChiliSoft include things like TDD, test-driven development. We're big advocates of it as a tool. And continuous integration. Uh, not just always having a build server, but you know, working on master, that type of thing. We, we didn't branch throughout the course of the project. We had everyone committing to the same branch, well, master. So we've got a boot camp. We've got some values. You know, as things progress, it seems as though there's a bit of a, a missing space here. And there's, there's you know, some, a need to bring focus to it. So there's some principles or key areas, whatever you want to call it, that I decided was important to focus on. And the first one, excuse me, was around communication. So I mean, obviously we communicate, we're talking at each other all the time, we're sending messages. Well, interestingly enough, we didn't have email, but um, it's not really that type of communication. You know, it's about in, in, um, in choosing encouragement over criticism. So being kind to people, not, not being aggressive and mean about the feedback you're offering, but finding ways of rephrasing it so that they're, they're receptive to it. Um, criticism puts people in an away state, a defensive space. So there's a, um, a guy named David Rock. Uh, he's uh, created the Neural Leadership Institute, and he uses brain-based coaching. And it, one of his uh, concepts is around towards and away states. So the amygdala is the primitive part of our brain that's responsible for fight or flight. And you know, if you're in a fight or flight state, you're running away from the thing, or you're trying to fight it. You're not really listening and engaging. A towards response would be creating a safe space, safe environment for people to come in and receive that feedback in such a way that they can action it meaningfully. Exercising humility is an important aspect of communication. I think it's one we all struggle with in this industry. Um, I know I've struggled with it. Developers, we tend to have big egos. We think we're amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to receive that feedback, um, even, even if someone is trying to draw us into a, a safer place to have that conversation. Becoming habitually positive is an important aspect of communication as well. You know, negativity is draining and contagious. You're just, you're going to bring the IQ of your group down collectively. The problem solving abilities are going to go down the more, the more negative you are. It's about listening, you know, not just to respond, but to understand. And it's it, using it as a tool to humanize our colleagues. I think this is really important, you know, sharing personal stories, bringing focus to the fact that we're all unique and we all have our own history. So when there is friction, when there is an argument, we don't get caught up in the petty details about someone's making prawns in the break room for breakfast and it stinks. Um, you know, <laughs> we focus more on the actual conversation we're having. We can, we can humanize them. We can see them as an individual. We can empathize with them. So we've got communication. Another key element is collaboration. So it's great that we're all working as a team. Um, you know, collaboration isn't just about some emails, phone calls, throwing information around, trying to communicate at each other. It's about training, coaching, and mentoring. All buzzwords, I know. If you're playing bingo, you can mark them off. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's really about coming into that space where we're trying to, to collectively move forward in the right direction. And the reason collaboration is important is we innovate faster, we see mistakes quicker, uh, we find better solutions to the problems we're facing. And performance increases. So it's very tempting in this industry to think, oh, you know, if I give everyone a whole bunch of work and, you know, they're all busy, things will get done better. You know, my experience, that's not what works. It, it works to create a space where people can go have a three-hour conversation around a whiteboard to find the best design for the problem that they're facing or to clarify a misunderstanding about how the system should work. 
people need that space to, to do those innovative type of activities. And finally, um, so collaboration, uh, mo communication, collaboration, motivation uh, is, the, um, is the final one. And motivation is not in the typical stick and carrot sense. Uh, in the book, Drive the Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us <clears throat> by Daniel Pink, he says, carrots and sticks are so last century. You know, drive, you know, motivations really around autonomy, mastery, and purpose. They all sound like agile type concepts. So I mean, autonomy is about the desire to be self-directed. It's about increasing engagement over compliance. And I think this is key in the age of the knowledge worker. You don't want someone to just do something because they were told to do it. You know, that's kind of what the client environment's like. They get delegated to tasks. They don't really ask questions. They get it done. So you know, this idea of giving them a bit more control over their work um, increases engagement. People think a bit more about what they're doing. You know, mastery, the urge to get better. We all want to be good at what we do. We all want to be better than what we are today. And purpose, you know, <clears throat> the desire to do something has meaning is important. So I think that's adding value, moving things forward, not just completing a task, but actually seeing the, the fruits of our hard work show up in the source code. So we've talked a bit about the values of Chili Soft. <clears throat> excuse me some of the, the principles or focus areas to kind of bridge down from values. And I want to talk just briefly about you know, my management philosophy, kind of why I, I'm in management in the first place, why I think it's important that you know, we focus more on the, the, the team. You know, software is a team sport. So when I started, it was very much viewed as a, you know, an individual type of activity. Throw some pizza, throw some uh, Mountain Dew, whatever your favorite soda is at the guy, and he'll just you know, print code. It'll be amazing. Well, we know that doesn't work. You know, the, the idea of the rock star programmer, though it may so exist in some cultures, I don't think it has a place. And once again, I, I very much used to be of a very different opinion around that. Um, so if we're, if we're seeing it as a team sport, we're optimizing for the feature story. We're not trying to optimize for the individual. We're not trying to keep everyone busy making sure that, you know, these highly paid people are always earning their salary doing tasks. We're giving them the space to collaborate uh, around features, around stories, around, you know, the space to innovate, the space to move things forward in a meaningful way, giving them the autonomy to do that. You know, and group norms are the key to that success. <clears throat> One way to surface that is working agreements. They're a great way to broadcast to the world, well, at least if you put them on the wall, um, how the team should engage, what are the practices they're going to be applying. And because software is a team sport, I think it's really important to reward the behaviors you want. I've been in environments where they say we're agile, and you know, if you're caught pairing for more than an hour, you're bad because you clearly don't know the problem you're solving. Why are you both working together? You're just chit-chatting. You're going to have to stay late. It's the wrong way to approach it. You want to you really encourage that collaboration. You really want to create that space where if the whole team needs to go around a whiteboard for half the day to better understand you know, maybe some of the big architectural pieces, then great. You know, everyone will walk away more informed. Maybe they'll have found better solutions to some of the problems they're facing. Um, it's fantastic. So I truly believe the root cause of technical debt is the focus on the short term. We're always trying to make that sprint. There's always a, like a death march to make the commitment. Wrong approach. We never made every single sprint or milestone. Milestones are monthly for us. Um, we, things rolled over. There was a fluidity around, you know, what can we deliver? What's within the team's capacity? Is the system moving in the right direction? We did, we did some overtime. Okay, sure, we did a little bit of extra time to, to make up some gaps here and there, but we didn't do a lot of it. Uh, you know, I think if we did maybe, let's say, let's say 80 hours in the whole year of overtime, that would probably be a bit much. Um, and, we, and we metered it out, you know, just little by little, hour, hour every day. Just take a little extra step forward. Let's get into some of the practices. So I mentioned working agreement. Um, I think this was really key in the beginning. So when we did that boot camp, values workshop type of idea, we wanted to make sure the, that everyone was on the same page around how we were going to work. Um, so things that were important to us in a working agreement was TDDing, um, always pushing to master before you go home, not leaving if there's a broken build, things I would consider foundational to any team functioning. Honestly, I just don't know how you can build software if you don't have that level of expectation. 
And one that was really new for the guys was open and honest communication. Um, because they come from more of the top-down bureaucratic style environment, they're not used to having that freedom to express how they feel or to you know, say, well, I don't really think that's the best way to do it. And I think it was really important that we made that visible. And the wonderful thing about working agreements is you can make them, put them on the wall. We just use stickies on a piece of white paper. And the team can start to reinforce its own values. Like, I don't need to carry a stick. I don't need to say, hey, Bob, why didn't you push? You know, like, or Jane, why aren't there tests on this bit of, bit of code? The team can do that at the stand-ups. You know, if they see an issue, they can start holding each other accountable. <clears throat> and when you start to see that behavior, you know there's buy-in to those values, those norms, those ways of existing. Another one that I mentioned briefly was the idea of software conversations. Creating a space. We took one hour a week, just one hour a week. We had a tight schedule. We took one hour for software conversations. And we talked about things. You know, after a while, it became really apparent that you know, even though the, the Imani guys were you know, becoming more skilled, they were understanding all these new practices and ways of approaching software, they maybe didn't get some of the finer grain detail. And so finding a collaborative uh, technique to, to encourage that, I came upon, upon software conversations. I initially called this strategic software or something or another, and everyone's like, you're nuts, that's too management to bring it down to us. Um, <laughs> so the idea was really just, <clears throat> it started off with, okay, so in TDD, you end up with you know, a lot of test data builders and factory methods and just basic design patterns starting to emerge. And you know, some of the more junior guys, um, so we had two juniors from the Amman side, uh, didn't necessarily get some of the finer details. So we took this time to just talk about what builders were, what factories were, to look at code, not write code, just to look at it, read it, and discuss. Just like you maybe would have a book club. You're reading a book and you're talking about it. Um, same thing we're doing with code. You know, and it started to have these really awesome types of conversations around, okay, well, that's what a builder is, and that's why I would use it in, you know, that's fluent syntax, and oh, wow, this is amazing. And once we got those, those what I would consider real basic elements out of the way, we started to talk about higher level things, like clean code. We took the book Clean Code and we worked through it chapter two every week. And we would just have conversations. Why are comments bad? Why is naming important? You know, all too often in code reviews and those style of things, people get into the nitty, nitpicky things like, oh, your braces aren't arranged correctly, or your enums aren't Pascal case. I think that's really a waste of energy because there's tools to check a lot of that. And there's a higher level conversation to be had. Though it's annoying, I don't think it directly impacts code maintainability as much as naming. Understanding, truly understanding single responsibility, single level of abstraction, you know, interface segregation. Have I broken this out well enough so that you know, when I come to make a change, I only need to touch that file, not 20 files in the system. Those are the things I feel if you're gonna do code reviews, you should be focusing on. So this com software conversations was a space to elevate the type of conversation we were having and really focus on the more abstract things that even though we all know what solid is, what you think is solid, and what I think is solid can be different things. We had it with um, uh, a piece of code that was open-closed. I, I, I it really hit me when Brendan and I, my right-hand man, were arguing over, is it open-closed? Did we, did we violate the principle? You know, and it suddenly dawned on me that there was a big gap. Even when we both well understood solid, there's a big gap even at the senior level of what that actually means and what's it look like in code. Another thing that I'm, I'm quite chuffed with is uh, the idea of red bins. So it comes from lean manufacturing. It's an excellent, excellent communication tool. So in lean manufacturing, you get a big red bin, all the defects go into it, and you talk about it. Well, in software development, we've got a physical Kanban board. Uh, we gen I generally prefer physical boards. And we've got a piece of paper that says red bin on it. We've got some red stickies and a marker. And if you think there is missing tests, you think that we didn't implement a feature fully, if you've got a question about how something's done or why it's there or not there, you write it on a red bin. And every day at the end of the stand-up, we would discuss those issues. We'd clarify the questions, you know, things that were actual real technical debt we would prioritize onto our Kanban board because so debt's just as important as features. If we're going to get long-term productivity, we need to make sure we're servicing the code base or making sure that you know, it's ticking over just like a car. You gotta take it in for a service. You can't just drive it into the ground. Um, so we're looking a bit more to the future. 
And in, in, you know, in doing that, having those conversations, we're creating a real quick way to provide feedback, clarity. We're creating a space for those towards responses. It's non-threatening. It's not like, oh my gosh, Bob, why did you forget to put tests on this? It's like, oh gosh, okay, we're missing tests. What happened? Let's understand it. It's an issue. Okay, let's go after it. That type of thinking. And it really, it really worked well. Um, after a while, though, it started to build up. You know, we got some red bins. Project's been moving along for a while. Then we're like, hmm, how do we go about tackling this? Well, we were using experiment cards to drive change in our processes, both just things we were observing or activities out of retrospectives. So the experiment cards comes from the Lean Innovation stack, um, if anyone's familiar. And we're like, okay, cool, let's do an experiment for the typical thing people do and say, let's go bash the bugs for a week or a sprint or a month or whatever, whatever time frame it is. So we filled the experiment card in. And we go after it, and lo and behold, it fails dismally. Guys are unmotivated. Uh, we hardly touched any of the stuff on the board. Not the, not the result I was hoping for. So I was like, hmm. Well, part of this card is to figure out what's next. What's next? What's next? Let's try something different. Let's just chop it down to a week. Let's come back to some of those core principles that we, we really believe in. So we were like, OK, we're going to do something called our red bin. So every day. You're going to pair up with someone, and you're going to take a red bin, a piece of technical debt, and you're going to work on it. And it's fantastic because it started to expose the guys to a deeper sense, the, especially the Imani guys, a deeper sense of the idea of collective code ownership. Something that was very foreign to them, something I think we were comfortable with, but we, we took it to a new level. So in their, in their organization, if you write a piece of code, you're pretty much responsible for making sure that it's maintained. If there's issues, you need to look after it. We had that in, happen a few times during the course of the project. One of the, the many hurdles we had to overcome. And, and it, was just, it was such an invaluable moment when one of the senior guys just went, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, you know, I, really, I really get this. Like, he started evangelizing co collective code ownership as a practice. You start to see the impact of, of the values and the beliefs in the way of working the ChiliSoft influencing the clients. So we've talked about some communication practices. There's really one collaboration practice I want to talk about. Uh, and that's the idea of a 10x developer. But I'm not going to address it in the way you're probably thinking of. Typically a 10x developer is this amazing rock star guy who can come in and pump out 10 times the work of everyone else. That's really the wrong approach here. That's absolutely the wrong way to approach this. For me, my 10x developer was a, um, a coach and a mentor. He had reduced feature delivery expectations. So rather than 10 times what the average developer could deliver, he delivered half or a quarter. What he did deliver were key architectural components. So one of the other things we experimented with in this project was implementing the clean architecture. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's a fairly abstract set of diagrams. It's really just representing dependency and version in your architecture. You know, so we had to distill down the thinking and find a way of making it work. Um, so you focused there, focused on some of the other technologies. Um, so, so he had a reduced delivery expectation, but so he could multiply everyone else's contribution. So if he's moving everyone else from 1x to 2x, suddenly I got my 10x developer. Not because he's being a rock star, but because he's being a great coach and mentor. He's actually able to grease the team. He's able to help resolve some issues. He's able to just help move thinking forward when it needs a little nudge. Um, and it, it, it amazingly has an effect on the rest of the team. They start to say, OK, I can organically pair. I can find ways of solving problems. People don't have to tell me to pair anymore. It becomes part of the team culture. Suddenly, things start moving better. If he's a little bit overloaded, go find someone else who can answer your question. So one of the, the last set of practices is really around the motivational side of things. So, I mean, the team building, I mean, it's pretty obvious. I, I'd never done too much of it before. Um, but you know, the, the importance was really emphasized here on this project. Um, we, you know, we did some things like bowling, uh, going out to, to lunch, uh, having a braai in the park on Christmas. Even though they don't celebrate Christmas, we were all a little homesick. It was a nice way to just kind of create an interesting environment in which 
we, even though we were familiar with the concept of a braai, an Omani braai was still a bit different to, to what we were expecting. Um, you know, and it just helps build team uh, coherency. Other things we use team building for were celebrations. They have this idea of an Omani breakfast, which is a piece of flatbread, a bit of processed cheese, some Omani chips, which are just kind of like spicy potato chips, crunched up, sprinkled on the flatbread, add some hot sauce, and you eat it. Um, <laughs> it's delicious. I'm sure it's not the healthiest thing in the world for you, but it was delicious. Uh, so we use that as a, as a way to celebrate, you know, the idea of taking some of their culture back into ours, not just always trying to give them aspects of ours. Um, that was fun. That was interesting. You know, one of the other ways we found motivation, uh, one, one of the other motivational practices was around the idea of daily, delivering daily value. It's a concept we call sticky refactoring. Um, so our Kanban board works a little bit different than most Kanban boards. Uh, we use feature columns, so feature A, feature B, feature C. The stickies for that feature go under it. A sticky gets pulled in. The next day at the stand-up, the developer talks about what he achieved on that sticky, what's still in progress, and what did he learn. It's a great way to actually go, okay, cool, I know I'm going to discover things. Let me express that. Rather than putting a sticky there and letting it sit there for two weeks, well, you say I'm 10%, 20%, 22%, 25% done. Those, those are meaningless numbers. You know, and being able to visually represent that, when you see the stickies under the columns, you start to get a sense of what the progress really is on that feature. Um, we also start to trigger positive feedback loops in the brain. Because we're achieving things, we get happy and euphoric, and you know, we want to achieve more. So it's a way of motivating. Um, yourself. Because you're doing things, the brain's like, well, keep doing that thing you're doing. You're doing great. Um, so it kind of starts building in this, this natural mechanism um, without carrying a stick, without putting a carrot out there, just little tricks. Another concept uh, is the idea of you build it, you demo it. You know, this really fits into that uh, autonomy and purpose uh, component. So, you know, we had demos once a month with the clients, and I wanted to make sure that the guys really engaged with their work. We didn't really do explicit code reviews. We had sonar, picked up some issues. We had red bins. We had continual pairing for the most part. I'd do some reviews here and there. If there was an issue, we'd have a little mini demo. Um, but we used the demos to really drive that engagement with the feature. And you know, I found that it really ensures developers test their work, because no one wants to be embarrassed in a demo when something doesn't work. Strangely enough, social pain is registered the same in the brain as physical pain. So if I smash your hammer or I embarrass you hectically, your brain perceives the two as the same. So we want to avoid that. Um, ensures developers understand the problem they're solving. All too often, we love to hop into code and just start coding because it's fun and going and going and going. It, you know, I, I really believe practices like TDD help us take smaller steps and solve problems better. But even if we're not doing something like that, you know, knowing that I have to demo this feature, I'm the guy that did it, I'm the guy that's going to have to take that feedback to the team and discuss it later, is a way of making sure we're solving the right problem and asking the right questions. Uh, it enables autonomy and trust. So you know, I've got the expectation that you can deliver a feature. I'll check in every now and again, see how it's going. But for the most part, I trust that you're going to do your job. You're a bright person. I employed you for a reason. You know, that's, that's the thinking we should have. Rather than, I need to micromanage people, I need to give them written, clear instructions about what they're doing. Finally, maybe it's a unique thing to put under the motivational practice, um, but it's deliberate practice. So deliberate practice is something that's very core to ChiliSoft. There's a, I'd say TDD and deliberate practice are two foundational aspects of, of the culture we have. So deliberate practice is a time where we get to set aside production work. We get to focus on maybe learning a technology, practicing a skill, you know, something that's not got the pressures of actually trying to deliver. So it was, it was really, you know, it's, it's really important because if you don't practice a skill, it degrades over time. So someone who's been doing software development for 10 years who hasn't deliberately tried to practice, like be deliberate about it, has a lower level of skill potentially than someone who's been doing it for three years just because of the, the entropy factor. So we use deliberate practice as a, as a tool to um, you know, explore new technologies. In the beginning, it was around TDD, getting the guys to understand the practice of TDD. 
Eventually it was around, okay, well, we need to use Elasticsearch because the requirements have changed. I can't give everyone access to a feature with Elasticsearch, but I want everyone to have experience with the technology. So let's, let's explore Elasticsearch. So everyone's got some exposure to it. So even the more junior guys who aren't working in that area of the system still have an understanding of what's going on. They still have context when we have those conversations. Then we eventually turn to Node because, well, we're using C Sharp, a bit of Node on the back end for reporting. And then we landed up at this idea of this mob cartas. And um, we got there because, you know, the guys were doing TDD, but I wasn't convinced they were fully bought into it. Um, just because of the conversations we were having, looking at some of the code, it looked like they were doing a lot of upfront design and then just implementing it and writing tests around it, which I don't agree with. I don't think that's very TDD. Nothing wrong with picking a point on the horizon, but understand that you need to pivot. You know, some of the solutions you'll end up with are far more elegant and simple than you could have ever imagined. So we started doing this mob session cartas. Our mobs are a little bit different than your typical mobs. We usually have a driver, the guy at the keyboard, who writes a failing test and then the implementation. We have the team. They're observing what code's being written. And then we have a facilitator to kind of encourage conversation from the more introverted folks and maybe squash a little conversation from the more extroverted folks. Keep things drived and going in the right direction. And you know, it's amazing because while the driver's writing his failing test and his implementation, no one's allowed to criticize, no one's allowed to say a word. He's allowed to get his thinking out. Because my personal mantra is make it work, make it pretty, make it fast. So make it work. Just puke your brain onto the screen. Just who cares? It's on the screen. We can talk about it now. Make it pretty. Let's go do those refactorings where we find better names. We start to look at single responsibilities, single level of abstraction, that type of thinking. And you know, we've got a little snippet on the screen. OK, now the team can read the code. So we've expanded the re red-green refactor to red-green reflect refactor. Because oftentimes, people don't actually stop to read the code. We just, our brain fills in what we think is happening there. So if we actually read the code, read our tests line by line, we start to have more meaningful conversations about what's happening. And in doing so, we started to actually fill in some of those missing pieces in the Amani's understanding around, and probably even some of our own understanding around, some of the deeper nuances of TDD, why we do things a certain way. OK, what's, is this the right approach? What do I do in this scenario when x, y, and z happens? Maybe you're meant to have a fading test, but it's green. Like, you know, how do I, how do I get to the, the bottom of that? So I guess in summary, it's really around communication, collaboration, and motivation. Motivation being autonomy and purpose. You know, if we don't give people the autonomy to actually go do their job, if we don't trust them, it's going to be hard for them to find purpose in what they're doing. So after all, software is a team sport. So if we're optimizing for individual productivity, we're not actually all moving forward. Very similar to what Kent Beck was saying in the keynotes, you know, if you've got an N plus one legged race, you all have to work together to actually make progress. If we're all running around trying to get our own tasks done, we're not collaborating very well. We're not actually moving things forward in the right direction. And maybe that's some of what the standard mob programming is trying to get. You know, maybe I've distilled, I like to think I've distilled some of those elements out into a different way of achieving the same results. Um, and you know, it's really around building a culture of mentoring to find your 10x developer. You gotta find the guy who's willing to coach and engage. Not everyone is, there's nothing wrong with that. You need great feature leads, absolutely. But you also need the guys willing to engage with the team, willing to help move people's understanding forward, willing to take ownership of those big tech architectural pieces and ensure that you know, everyone's moving forward consistently. That's it. Any questions, thoughts? Ratio. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a hard one. I mean, my, my current team, I think I've got three juniors. Um, and I, I, I'd say I, maybe two to one. You know, I don't think if you're really focused on the mentoring, if it's a, 
prime component of your day. I think having two people that you're working with is, is probably about as much as you can stretch. Sure. So, you know, some days our red bin would have 20 items in it. I don't want to stop the team every time there's an issue. Um, so it was really, we worked it into being part of the stand-up. We found that communication was actually quicker. Um, sometimes there would be, like, oh, what was that? I don't quite remember. But that was the exception, not the norm. Um, and the boot camp, I, I felt it was necessary to say, okay, here's how we're going to actually speed up the, uh, the integration of cultures. So I know there's a real lack of understanding on one side. We've got a pretty strong standing on the understanding on the other side. Let's let's get familiar with how this happens. After that, the guys were free to to engage and, and move forward in, in whatever way they saw fit. So I think it was a constraint more to the way the project was structured than how I would naturally uh, build a team. Yes. <laughs> so I think team building really helped kind of smooth that out, getting to know each other in the beginning. Uh, you know, we, we all lived together throughout the course of the project, the Chili Soft side. Surprisingly, we all got along really well. There weren't any, any issues. I, w I was actually expecting there to be some problems, at least in, in my flat. I don't know about the other flat. Maybe Richard can speak to that. <laughs> um, but you know, really creating that environment where you've humanized people, you start to just embrace and understand and converse. Just having coffee, we'd have conversations about things. You know, I grew up on a farm. You know, there was some of the other the Imani guys were talking about you know experiences and what date date farm date palm farms were like. And so there was you know found some common ground and talked around that. Um, but I think just just generally creating a space where it, we were free to communicate in whatever way we wanted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hmm. Good question. Um, well, I think we would have had to have some kind of digital board to to collaborate uh, across location. Um, uh, I think there would have been a need to find some way of doing a lot of these things, but in a more digital sense. So maybe we do Skype for business for like our Bob Carter sessions. Uh, we maybe have to be a bit more strict about code reviews. Um, I think scheduling and rhythms would become far more critical. So we did have some off of office rhythms around when these things happen, just so that we could we could broadcast that to people. But I think we'd have to be more strict around scheduling certain times if we're trying to, to do over distance. I haven't really had that experience, so um, it's a difficult one for me to answer. Yes. Ah, so I didn't do a lot of code. That, that's the first thing. I tried and I failed dismally because other things kept pulling me in every other direction. And eventually the guy's like, please quit coding. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the way I did still try to stay active in coding is in the evenings. I, I actually went around developing cartas and playing with them. So, you know, outside of the work environment, I still tried to write some code. But in the work environment, I didn't end up writing a whole lot of code.
Scrum or Kanban setting. Yes, that's where I had probably the worst experience with Agile ever. Um, <laughs> it was seen as a mini waterfall to beat people into submission. So. Okay. So was, was it, were there issues in getting them to take your advice? So, so well, I, it, I'm kind of, I'll, I'll offer it and it's their choice to go after it or not. So like only in, you know, maybe the key architectural pieces would I really be adamant about having a conversation until we could reach agreement. So it wasn't about forcing my opinion, it was finding a middle ground. So maybe, you know, they're coming with a different perspective to what I am. Brendan and I would argue, and out would pop something amazing, actually, better than what either of us had. So engage in that conversation. Try to find a middle ground if there's a difference of opinion. Um, if you really know it's better, find some way of coaching someone that, in that direction. Don't just offer up a solution. Try to ask leading questions. Engage with them there. Thank you.